Well, thanks for getting up this morning, everyone. I know tomorrow that'll even be harder. So I'm Stephen Ewells from the AI Center of Excellence in the Office of CTO, and uh, Vacek Pavlin up here as well. So today we're going to talk about data science in the Open Cloud Exchange model. Um, and for those that don't know what an Open Cloud Exchange is, we will get into exactly what that is. And there's a great demo. So first off, the good, the bad, and the ugly of proprietary clouds. So I, you know, we all, most of us in here probably work at Red Hat, at least I know the back row does. So we know a lot of these things. But benefits, right? Elasticity, integration, security, you can defer costs, uh, service abstraction, uh, you know, they have operational excellence, and they're built on open source software. But with all those benefits, there's a lot of, of negatives as well. Um, first, vertical lock-in, data gravity. So for those that have never heard the term data gravity, it's basically that the, the platform that owns your data also owns your processing because you're not going to upload terabytes and terabytes of data to Azure just to then pull terabytes down to process it locally, right? You're going to do your processing up in Azure as well. So once they own your data, they own all of the investment around processing and everything you do with that data going forward. Um, from an open source software perspective, the public clouds do a great job of benefiting from all of the hard work and effort that goes into open source software, but they generally don't contribute back, right? And this has just always been an ongoing problem. Then there's the lifecycle dependency, right? Amazon, Google, they can change their services at will, and you as somebody who's leveraging that service just has to react to it. They may drop support for that service. Um, so you're, you're somewhat at the mercy of what they decide to do from a life cycle perspective. Um, and then there's the, the challenge of black box uh, services and their reproducibility. So when you think about uh, highly governed or, or, or regulated industries like finance and healthcare, if you're making a decision based on data, you need to be able to justify that decision. And in these, these black box services, you don't know what processing they're doing. And there's not necessarily the reproducibility. If somebody changed the code in the background of that service, the answer you get the second time you run the exact same data through may be different, and that presents a challenge from a regulatory perspective. So why not just use a private cloud, right? You've got all those challenges with the public cloud. Well, don't use it, right? Just do it all on premise. We, we certainly sell software that does that. Well, that has challenges too. First off, there's a lot of operational complexity in deploying and managing these stacks. So if you're a large organization, maybe that's something you can absorb. But if you're, if you're a smaller organization, that can be a real challenge, especially depending on the scale of the operation it is you have to support. Um, secondly, a lot of the private clouds have a poor user experience, right? That's a lot of the draw of using like Amazon services is that great user interface, that great user experience of just pointing, clicking, tying things together and how well that whole workflow goes. You don't generally get that same experience in a private cloud. Next, just the lack of diversity in services, right? Again, unless you're a huge shop with a huge development arm, you're probably not developing all the plug and play services that you're gonna get access to if you use a public cloud. And that can be a challenge. Or if you could develop them, the life cycle to get those things out the door is probably much longer than it is if you were just to use a service already sitting up in the public cloud. And then in general, private clouds tend to be costly in terms of support from a training perspective and operational excellence perspective. Which again, large scale shops, they can absorb some of that, but on a smaller scale, it's just not feasible. So you don't get the operational excellence you may need if you need a 24-7, you know, five nine system. So there are other alternatives out there, right? OpenStack's done a great job of, of proliferating their public clouds. There's a number of public clouds based on OpenStack that are out there in the world. And that's fantastic, actually so fantastic that it covers more regions of the world than any public cloud provider can offer pretty good claim, right, for an open source platform. But none of them have the scale or, or mission to attract the type of diversity you would get in the public cloud. So they tend to be pretty niche deployments of these things. Um, secondly, between the clouds, they're really not homogenous, right? There's a lot of diversity in the services they have. They're based on different base images. There's different flavors in the open stack deployments. So you can't really plug the things together very, very easily. Um, and last, not a single one of them has a mandate or the funds of trying to overcome any of these issues. There's not a single one of those things that's listed that is, is even worried about trying to build or collaborate across the other clouds. So that, that, that presents a challenge there. So what about a different model? A model we call the Open Cloud Exchange, where we bring together hardware vendors, software vendors, open source communities, research institutions, and governments together to operate in a collaborative way 
to provide a platform that can meet the needs of both the small and large scale users. So what is an open cloud experience? So it's an alternative cloud model where we bring together many stakeholders rather than just a single provider to participate in implementing the cloud, operating the cloud, and providing the services that folks are going to use on that cloud. It has a multi-sided marketplace where participants cooperate and compete. So if, if you're two joint organizations that have a need for a similar service, well, by all means, collaborate, put together that service, and offer it to others, and others will pay then for that service, and you recoup your costs that way. But you can also compete, right? There's nothing that says we can't have multiple services that provide similar capabilities, but maybe have different feature points or functionality points, you know, catering to maybe a highly regulated industry versus an open source community. And last, users can freely choose among the services out there. So we have this, this rich bed of services that's made available. Users can pick and choose which ones they need based on their particular use cases. And maybe those are based on cost. Um, you know, maybe it's something where you've contributed infrastructure into the environment, so you've received credits for your contribution, and therefore you want to cash in those credits on services that, that are relevant to you. It could be that's just based on general capability, right? You need something that's more secure, something that's more high speed. You know, all those things are available. So what are the core use cases we're looking at for Open Cloud Exchange? So again, this is an environment where you have multiple vendors that are contributing at every layer of the stack. So you have hardware vendors who are going to contribute infrastructure. You have network vendors who are contributing network components. You have software vendors putting up their software. You have open source communities putting in their components. You have private companies, so think of something like a, like a GE or Walmart. They're contributing infrastructure as well to meet their needs. So one of the, the common use cases here is, is if you have occasional seasonality where you need to be able to respond to high demand, it's not worth your time or money to invest in this massive private cloud on your infrastructure because you're only going to utilize it for a very short period of time. And then bursting in a hybrid cloud model up into Amazon may not be the best option for you. But you could overfund the OCX model with a little bit more than what you would have on, on your daily demand and run your workloads in the environment such that on a daily basis, you're actually receiving credits because you're not using all of the infrastructure you've provided. Then when you have one of your peak workloads, you explode and you may take up your fully donated resources plus other resources. But in that case, you're just redeeming credits for the extra infrastructure you already provided and it ends up being a net win from a cost perspective. So it's, it's a shared model where workloads have high variability. The next one is where software and hardware vendors get to contribute software, maybe before it goes GA, and they get real user feedback on how that software functions. They get, also they get a test the marketplace for it as well. So if you're a hardware vendor and you're developing some new chipset and you think that chipset is very well targeted to certain workloads, you can put that in the hardware into the OCX model and have users target their workloads for it and get feedback on how did it work, did it meet what we thought, and then you can tweak and tune before you actually enter the market with that hardware, knowing with some level of confidence that, hey, this does meet the workload and the demand we wanted, and now we have a public poop point that we can point to that says, hey, look, here's how well it did work. Next, it's a great platform for open software, open source software communities. Um, one, because open source software communities tend to be somewhat constrained on the infrastructure and hardware side and what they want to do to be able to truly serve their community. Well, this is a platform where they'd have access to resources they otherwise might not get access to, and it allows them to broaden their overall user base and to put services out there for folks to take advantage of, right? It, it kind of helps with the, the general publicity aspect of, of your community. And then lastly, it allows organizations that otherwise couldn't collaborate because somebody would have to own the infrastructure to collaborate on a set of infrastructure and say, hey, we, we want to do this project together. Let's put the hardware and infrastructure into this OCX model. We can work jointly there. We can share our data there. And it removes some of the barriers to, to actually making progress on these joint implementations. So, recap. Burn clouds are expensive. Industry locked out of a lot of clouds. There's a lot of niche industries that don't get access to it. Lots of great open source software out there that can benefit from and contribute to the environment. Um, all those niche markets out there that are underserved and can't afford to set up their own private clouds. Uh, lots of users and vendors out there or customers are concerned about vendor lock-in. And it doesn't have to be at the scale of AWS, right? There's, there's lots of studies that clouds don't have to be at AWS scale to actually provide cost benefit. 
So the first OCX implementation that Red Hat's been involved in was stood up in the Massachusetts Open Cloud. Um, for those that aren't familiar, I didn't put the website on here, but if you search Massachusetts Open Cloud, you'll, you'll see this out there. And it's a platform that brings together various uh, educational institutions, government institutions, private industry, and then a whole bunch of software vendors that have put all of this infrastructure, software, network in, into a common platform in support of this OCX model. And to date, so what is it? It's 90,000 square feet and growing um, with tens of thousands of users accessing this infrastructure. Where we and what we're gonna talk about today are getting involved is more on the OpenShift side of things where they want to, so a lot of what they've been doing right now has been farming out like virtual hardware for various research studies and, and use cases. And now what we're getting into is more of a as a service type platform where users and independent researchers don't have to worry about setting up the infrastructure or deploying any applications themselves. They'll just come in, go into an interface, do their data science experiments, and, and move on to the next thing. Um, so for our hardware, we have 250 cores, 1.5 terabytes of RAM. There's an OpenShift cluster that's been stood up, dedicated to, to this effort. And then they have tons and tons of Ceph storage. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Vacek to tell you more about the details of what we have running out there and how people are using it. Thank you, Stephen. Um, OK. So now you know about the hardware and the environment that we run in, and then now our team um, is building something we call Open Data Hub, uh, which is an AI as a service uh, platform, um, which we target as um, to, I don't want to say compete with, but show people that there is an alternative to, to other uh, cloud-provided, public cloud-provided platforms. Um, and it's a, it's a basically a meta project, so it doesn't, we don't specifically develop tools for machine learning, but we rather integrate existing tools, uh, whatever we find that community benefits from or community prefers. Um, and it's all built on open source and um, all what we do, all the integrations are also uh, being open sourced. Um, we also run Data Hub inside Red Hat um, currently which has more components than what we have publicly in our GitLab repo, um, but it's, it's, still, it's still going on and growing. Um, the goal, uh, apart from like, doing the integrations between things that currently are built in silos in, in a lot of cases, um, is also to foster the collaboration between those communities. Uh, so not only that we want to integrate things, but we would like to uh, help people and, and, and uh, push people into, into uh, collaboration and, and contribution between various projects. Um, another thing is also to ensure reproducibility. So um, with, as Stephen mentioned, with public clouds, you never know that the service is changed, the model that you are using can be changed. Uh, we think that if we build everything on open source, you can always find the, the, the real source of what you are running. And um, even from like compliance, uh, perspective or even from your interest, uh, you should be able to go and find why is the thing that you are using doing uh, the work in a way that, uh, that it is doing it. Um, another goal for Open Data Hub um, is uh, to build the flexible entry point layers. So if you are a researcher that needs to store a lot of data and just uh, have a very simple processing of it, uh, you should be able to just focus on the storage tier. Uh, if you are an app developer who has some data, but um, the most or the biggest, uh, the, the biggest problem is to where and how to run your applications, how to set up pipelines for that, uh, you should be able to find um, at the right level of, uh, of entry point for you as well. Um, and we also want to enable those users to pick and choose the services uh, whatever you are used to from the public cloud. So if you have a bunch of services, you are not bound to using them all, but uh, we want you to be able to choose uh, what, whatever is important for you. And, when the, uh, and, and if you are using the open cloud exchange model, then only pay for what you are using, obviously. Um, we deploy Open Data Hub right now to Massachusetts Open Cloud um, and operate it there, help with the operations of that. And basically, Red Hat is providing support for, uh, for OpenShift, and the Open Data Hub is running on top of the OpenShift. 
and we, we help the research communities that are on the Massachusetts Open Cloud to leverage those tools that we are providing there. Um, we are running an early adopter program on, a, on the Open Data Hub on Massachusetts Open Cloud, um, which is to find interesting, interested researchers and projects or companies that would like to try, to, try Open Data Hub, onboard them, help them to uh, figure out how to use the tooling, and then help them with the research that they are doing. So right now, uh, the two things that are running, the two early adopters that are running, uh, are Best Piece, which is a um, non-profit, I think, company that, uh, um, that is taking a lot of data from the beehives around the East Coast, and then they are processing it and trying to help the beekeepers to, to um, maximize their uh, bee health and, and uh, all the stuff around that. They are also cooperating with NASA. Uh, there, is a, there is a link to video, so when the slides are published, um, you will be able to see the video or you can put it into Google, I guess, um, where they collaborate and they did some mapping on Google Earth for the beehives and how things are influenced and stuff like that. So it's a really interesting video. Second project that we are working with is uh, those are basically university students, researchers, um, um, and their work is to analyze a lot of uh, various papers, theses, white papers, whatever you can think about, and build a network from the citations in those, so that if you are an author of a thesis and you thought, okay, so I wrote this medical-based uh, thesis, uh, so I'm probably influencing a medical um, industry or medical space. And then from this network that they are building, you can learn that your medical thesis also influenced, I don't know, some biology or, or a technical field or something like that. So um, that is also an interesting project. We also have other um, projects that would like to join that, um, but we, are, we have to onboard them very slowly because the infrastructure uh, and the operations uh, is not at the point where we can just put everyone on the cluster. Um, so I guess that if anyone is interested and probably can reach out, uh, there is a slide at the end. Um, come on, Pat. Can I say something? Yes. It's not a bit transparent. Uh, I, was, I have a friend at work, he is beekeeper, his uh, father, and I asked him one day, how many bees you have? So, so maybe the project can help. <laughs> it's a worldwide problem, B count. <laughs> um, so what is a stupid question, right? <laughs> what is a what is a like what are the patterns in the in the service and the platform that we are trying to build, right? So you still want to have a secure hybrid cloud platform. So there is Kubernetes, it's based on open source, so Kubernetes, Linux, S3, uh, set as a, as a foundation, and let's say Kafka is a stream processing and a uh, message bus thing. Uh, on top of that, you probably want to build some pipelines um, and you want to do an application lifecycle management, so there are some CI CD tools, uh, there are ways to store your data and to store your code and how to match them together. Um, when you are building an application, you'll probably do that in, in some language. So we have multiple language runtimes. Uh, and obviously it's running on top of Kubernetes and OpenShift, so whatever you bring in your container will run there, right? Analytics and AI processing um, is an important part because we are building an AI as a service platform. So we have a bunch of uh, tools regarding that. So for um, experimentation, we have Jupyter Notebooks uh, for uh, model evaluation, we are looking at uh, MLflow for model serving. There are other tools like Selden and, uh, and uh, TensorFlow serving. And we are also looking at a project called Kubeflow, uh, if you are familiar. It is a, it is a Kubernetes native um, workflow manager for data scientists, I would say, like with a lot of tools integrated. And we also have a, a bunch of common services uh, in there. So something like if you are familiar with AWS S3, uh, there is an S3 endpoint that you can access in that, in that uh, platform and in, in that cloud. Um, 
you can go up the layer. There is obviously uh, the part which, which spans the whole stack, so you need an identity management and, and policies and rule-based access control for things. So that is also uh, part of that or that's also uh, part of the problems that we are looking into. So what from the data science and the open data hub, what, what do we have for you as a user? Um, basically right now what is open source in a GitLab repo are these piece of technology. So we started with a set as a foundation for data. Uh, we expose S3 API from Seth so you can access it as a, as a, with an object storage. So if you look for an example, like how to do data science with uh, AWS, you probably find that everyone is using S3, so we have that as well. Uh, we use JupyterHub for uh, our data scientists to experiment in. Um, if you are not familiar with Jupyter Notebooks, I'll show a quick example of it later, but it is basically an interactive, uh, interactive uh, engine where you can write various uh, language, where you very, very can, very can use various programming languages uh, and interact with it through web UI. Um, so we don't have to install anything in, on your laptop and uh, we provide it in the cluster. Um, we use Apache Spark, uh, which is an um, AI engine, general AI engine, which can be used for uh, big data processing or model training and things like that. And then also TensorFlow is integrated, which is uh, the hot thing right now for building uh, AI uh, neural network models and other things. So I think it's time for the demo. Uh, so I'll show you what we have, what is, uh, what is, uh, how it's working. Um, I came up with two personas here. Um, so one is operations, is the people that will take Open Data Hub and deploy it to their infrastructure. Um, so as, for example, me was doing that with MOC, uh, uh, when we do something, when we add some services, um, I'm mostly the person to go and, and do that. And then we have data scientists, uh, which a bunch of them are sitting in the back row, so that's how I view them, um, where, who come and use the platform to, to do the data science. So uh, collect the data and then they can process it and, and work on that. Okay, so this is, uh, this is uh, OpenShift. Um, you probably maybe have seen some talk yesterday or you are planning to go to uh, some talks today about OpenShift. Uh, that's our enterprise distribution of Kubernetes. And if I want to deploy Open Data Hub, I, have, I had my OpenShift uh, administrators to add Open Data Hub APB. <coughs> into my OpenShift APB is a basically a packaging format for containerized applications uh, based on Ansible. So I just searched the catalog for Open Data Hub core. So now I'm, now, now I'm the operations person, right? So I want to deploy that. So I'll just click that. It, tell me, it tells me what it is, that it's an AI as a service platform based on open source. Great, that's exactly what I want. Um, I don't want to do the prod deployment, so I'll select the development plan from the, from the APB, and I need to select the project. Um, I'll create a new one. Uh, so let's call it demo. I don't need to fill in these. Uh, let, let's probably give it more memory, just for the sake of it. Um, I wanted to deploy all, all the images that we have for the notebooks, and I remember this that I can, I don't have to build all the images, I can just use them. So now I click create and when I go to the overview, I will start seeing things being deployed. So we are trying to make it as easy as possible for an integrated platform to not only that when you are using it, it should be easy, but it should be also easy to deploy it and uh, not have to go through too much trouble for that. Um, so, as I mentioned, part of the platform, and this is, this is just the dev plan, so this is more about like, if you want to try it, part of the platform is Ceph, in this case it's Ceph Nano, so that's uh, a single container deployment, it is not scalable, it doesn't give you a big data storage, uh, if you want that, you um, want to use the prod plan and you want to, use, you want to deploy Ceph on the side, 
uh, in a proper deployment, uh, not this not this small one. Um, we have a Jupyter Hub that's for accessing the notebooks and working with the notebooks. It brings in a database for itself to take care of users. And then we have a Spark operator, which is also built by, uh, by our colleagues in Red Hat from Red Analytics, um, which takes care uh, of uh, starting our Spark clusters. So if you are a user that comes to, um, that comes to Jupyter Hub um, and you decide to use a Spark for your analysis, You only need to log in and then you select the Spark notebook and the Jupyter Hub will know that you are going to do some Spark work. So when you spawn your Jupyter server, it will also create a Spark cluster for you to work with uh, so that you are not sharing the Spark cluster with others and uh, don't fight for resources uh, so that you know that whatever you do is, is there for you. So OpenShift Data Hub. Um, it is not there by default. Uh, I, I added it uh, there for, for the demo. Uh, but we have, if you go to opendatahub.io, there is a link to the repository, and in the repository is a readme uh, with the steps how to deploy Open Data Hub. I'll, I'll definitely get to it, uh, and I can show the can show the repository as well. Can I run it on my laptop, or is it You can, you can run it on your laptop, uh, but it will consume at least 12 gigabytes of, of RAM. So you probably need at least 16 gigs of RAM for your laptop. Uh, we are trying to, for the dev plan, we are trying to put it a bit down, but um, it is hard with, like, if you want to still make it useful or make it, like, so that you can try the stuff in Spark and not just wait for an hour to analyze 300 lines of some CSV file of RAM. So um, there are trade-offs, but yes, you can, you can definitely deploy it on your laptop with Minishift. Um, so I've already also deployed it here, and I did some configuration in there, so I'll just start it. Um, just to show how the notebook interface looks like and how we work with that. Um, so we basically can connect to Spark, uh, the integration is in a way that there is an uh, environment variable that gives you a Spark URL. <coughs> um, so you don't have to try to figure out how these things are connected, what is the name of the service or anything. It's all in, uh, in the environment variables. So now I, this is, the, this is the notebook, so you have these cells where you write the code and then you run them and it basically communicates with the backend on, uh, on the cluster uh, in OpenShift and uh, executes the code and then it returns back the results. <clears throat> and you can have, this is Python, but you can have different uh, kernels. Uh, that's how it's called, the engine that executes the code. Uh, so you can have R, you can have Julia, you can have, uh, we are looking into doing a MATLAB kernel or, or, or using a MATLAB kernel. Um, there are a bunch, bunch more, uh, like .NET and JavaScript and everything. So you can do, Interesting thing. So now you can see that it finished uh, and it returned some number computed in Spark. Um, it, is a, it is a great data science notebook, right? But as I said, I'm more into an operations part. So if like uh, guys in the back would present, they would probably show much more interesting stuff for the data science, right? Um, so here we have the how to access the Spark, so we also have the Spark server, the Spark server URL in our environment variables. Uh, so we can connect to it uh, and we can list the buckets in there. You can see that there is nothing, so I can, I can create uh, a bucket through the S3 API, and then I can uh, probably upload some file and, and take a look at um, and take a look at it. Um, so it's uh, returned 200, which should be good. So it's got created. Now it's uploading some file. I don't know why it's so slow. I think that the cluster is sick after yesterday's workshop when we where we basically burned it down. 
Um, so now I uploaded some file and now I can see <clears throat> that the file that I uploaded is actually this notebook, so OVH for test I IT notebook. And uh, you can see that it is uploaded there. So if you imagine I would have some big CSV uh, with 10 thousands of lines, I would upload it and then I can I can work with uh, true Spark. I can use SQL queries on that file and things like that. Um, so I think that's that's it for the demo. And I'll go back to the slides. <coughs> Maybe it's just internet. Slow. Yeah, it could be. Internet. So if there are any questions while, while we are loading here, feel free to, feel free to ask. Uh, and so one of the things, so again, kind of pointing back to the beginning, you know, what Vatek talked about and the open cloud exchange. So, uh, you know, it, it, maybe we go over pretty quickly, but if you were an independent data scientist and you wanted to do that type of experiment, that was a lot of infrastructure that got all laid down with a couple of answers into some boxes and you immediately could go in and start using the environment. I mean, it was already plumbed together, so you don't even have to know about the other services, right? They're all just environment variables. All that's taken care of for you, so your concern is more than about your research, your project, your data. Everything else was just working, right? Very similar to like an Amazon SageMaker type experience or an Azure or a Google, all done with open source software in an open cloud exchange model. I feel enough time for you. I don't know. Oh, did it not start? No. Oh. Yeah. So, uh, you had talked earlier about uh, some of the principles behind Open Data and how you wanted to, you know, enable collaboration between communities and, and kind of stick to open principles and, and user choice is kind of a big component of what's going on and, and flexibility of tooling. I'm curious um, about like, future plans or maybe the roadmap. And will the users be able to bring their own tooling into this environment? Like, Yep, absolutely. So right now, and I think this is actually one of your... Yeah, okay. I'll, I can, I'll skip this one and I'll go right here. So for the question to answer it, uh, that's probably this part, what's next? So right now, what I showed is what is in the GitLab, basically, uh, for the Open Data Hub deployment. And we want to add more components. So as I mentioned before, we run many more components internally. So we want to add them there. But also, if someone has an idea what it, what should be there, what is missing, uh, it is a public GitLab repository. So pull requests are welcome. Feel free to fix it. Uh, <laughs> no, I mean, honestly, if if, if there are ideas uh, from the, coming from the community, it would be even better than us just pushing everything in there. Uh, we would definitely love that. I think, and that may fall under the lessons learned side of things, is I think from like the user experience, when it's up and running, they love the experience, right? It's extremely intuitive, very easy, uses interfaces they're already accustomed to using. Oh, and it died. Um, the biggest challenges we've had thus far are really more around operating the environment. Um, and that's probably something we, we took for granted in the beginning because the, the, the MOC has a pretty extensive experience running uh, OpenStack Cloud and they're just new to OpenShift. So there's probably a bit more on the enablement side we should be doing there to you know, help accelerate that. But from a user experience side, it's been, all the feedback's been extremely positive. Yeah, and for it, and it plays into the lessons we learned. So um, it is hard to plan capacity for data science un until you know what the person is actually going to do. So uh, that's something we need to get better with. We are starting, uh, um, a cooperation with uh, a profit store, yep. right? With the MOC, so they are, they have like they are analyzing the workloads and then uh, they are um, potentially changing the resource limits and things like that um, based on some machine learning models. So that might help there. Um, as Steven said, um, OpenShift version three is pretty hard to operate on scale and like keep it keep it up, keep it running, keep everything working. With like storage and registries and everything, um, so that uh, that was, I think, the biggest hurdle because we we got we bumped into a lot of 
these obstacles on the way to like keep stuff running in the MOC on top of OpenShift. So they are still learning. They are completely new to OpenShift. So it's a it's a hard road to take. Uh, we hope that OpenShift V4 will solve that for us because it's all self-driving and machine learning based, right? So, and operator based. Um, one another problem that we have is aligning priorities and setting up the communication with the operations uh, of the MOC. So uh, it, it is hard to like, at the beginning it was hard to know what is, what is important to do first. So we were like, okay, so give us some cluster and then we deploy it there and we try it. But then we realized the cluster is, I don't want to say useless, but it, it is not big enough and it's not stable enough and it's not production enough to, to actually like onboard people on that. So now they are setting up a new bigger cluster uh, which is bringing new problems because they, they set up a new open stake and, and like different versions of things, stuff like that. So um, we are still working on that and like how to, how, to do, how to build a process around these things to get OpenShift running uh, in a production manner and then have open data up running on that in a production manner as well. And for the what's next uh, as well, I uh, mentioned that uh, we would definitely welcome contributions and we're going to put more components, more deployment uh, configurations for the components that we run internally. But we're also working on something called uh, AI library and AI ops. So we would like to add that to the Open Data Hub. So AI ops is basically using machine learning and AI to operate your cluster to help with the operations, analyzing logs, analyzing metrics. So we would like to add, add that to the to Open Data Hub itself. Uh, an AI, AI library is a set of components and pre-trained models and a, and, a, and, a, and, a, and code that can train the model um, where you can pick and choose, like I have the data, it's in the right format, I can just choose an algorithm that I want to do, like correlation or clustering or something, and you get data out of it uh, or the results out of it on the other end. So that is also, it is part of the, um, part of the open data app but uh, it is not integrated in the public repository uh, well enough yet. Um, we are also, as I mentioned, Selden and TensorFlow serving, and there are other tools uh, looking into model serving. So if you are able to um, train a model and you can do it in the Jupyter Notebook, that's not uh, such a big deal if you have enough resources, but it needs you to up upload the model somewhere so that you can do to the S3 endpoints to the object storage, right? That's also easy. But then you need to have a simple way how to run the model so that you can make predictions from that, so you can query the, the model itself. So we are looking into adding maybe Selden or uh, Kubeflow has other, other tooling. Um, there, are, there are multiple ways how to, how to do these things. So we are looking at, uh, and investigating these. Um, and we are also working uh, with the, uh, the Boston University and uh, that's on my previous slide. Also we work, uh, work on that with the Czech Technical University on an open cloud marketplace. So basically building a marketplace uh, with the services on top of open cloud and figuring out pricing for these services automatically. And uh, like, uh, so that you, as Steven mentions, like if you provide an infrastructure, you get some credit for it. And basically you can then spend them in the marketplace on uh, consuming other services and other resources. Right, is there a scale to I'd say we are still working on the actual like boundaries of the marketplace and how it will actually work. Uh, I, I don't know yeah. too much about this project, to be honest. So. The way they've done the scheduler right now is, is they actually undersubscribe their resources. So if, if you were to come in and request a certain amount of, of resources, if they showed up as available, you would be sure you got them. So they don't, right now there's, they have, they're hardware rich and software poor. So you're no chance of running out of infrastructure right now. And it's first, first, uh, first take, uh, how do you say, first request, first get. Right now, or, yeah. Or, or who contributes most has more uh, right to, to. That's the marketplace first. model we're working on. So right now it's, again, there's no issue with, with accessibility. The marketplace model they're trying to come up with is exactly that, is how do we prioritize based on all those factors and the credits received, the contributions made, um, and that's, they're actually gonna apply some machine learning to how that calculation gets derived. So that's an area of investigation that falls a little bit outside of what we're doing from an Open Data Hub perspective, but it's something they're doing from an operations side. 
And probably one thing to add on, I guess, to Mike's question before about the, the software within Open Data Hub and what we're like roadmap wise, we haven't gone into the full roadmap here for Open Data Hub, but there's no technology limitation as to what goes in Open Data Hub. Again, it, it's sort of a meta project that ties things together. So today, the fact we use Jupyter Notebooks is simply because that had the greatest demand from within Red Hat and from the users we spoke to. We're starting to get increased requests for things like RStudio, and if someone wanted to bring along Zeppelin and contribute that into the environment, that would be fine, right? We're, we're not saying that notebooks are the only interface into data science. So it's just, this is where we started. So we described how we work with MOC with Massachusetts Open Cloud. Um, we are also starting to work with uh, universities in Czech Republic. Uh, currently, we are working with Masaryk University in Brno and the Syriac Scientific Cloud that uh, they run uh, together with uh, Cessna. Uh, and the goal is to also um, get them to deploy. They are, they are moving to OpenStack and to, and to Kubernetes, so our goal is to uh, get some open shift there so that we can deploy open data hub um, and also like encourage them to use that uh, we also we already came up with that one pilot project for for doing that so I think that's that's going to go very well and then we are uh, also uh, working with the AI Center at the uh, Faculty of Electrotechnics uh, and at Czech Technical University in Prague um, they are also building some data centers so we are consulting them with how to how to build it so that Open Data Hub and OpenShift can run there. Uh, but we also collaborate with them on a, on a specific project um, from the data science, machine learning, and uh, AI world. So uh, one of them is uh, the data dynamic pricing that uh, Stephen mentioned uh, for the marketplace. Uh, so they would like to help us build models uh, and how to build those models for the dynamic pricing. Um, we are working in our team on a, on a um, project called Thought, which you can go talk to Christoph in the back about it, uh, which is for help, to help developers to find the right set of dependencies for their projects. Um, so we also will collaborate with the Czech Technical University on that. And then also they are very interested in the AI ops stuff for, uh, for the Open Data Hub. So analyzing logs, metrics, things like that to, to get um, to get your operations of your clusters uh, simpler so that you don't have to like look at all the metrics with your eyes but some model can do it for you and then you just get a very nice alert on the uh, on if something is happening uh, we already went through this and that's basically it for the talk so you can try it yourself as there was a question whether you can run it on your laptop uh, so I answered yes, you can, um, but it's going to consume a lot of resources from your laptop, so we'll, we will try to work on that. Um, but you can spin up a VM and deploy it there, I guess. If you go to opendatahub.io, uh, you will find uh, we are starting to push out some content for like blog posts. Uh, there is a mailing list that you can subscribe to where all the news will be there, or you can provide suggestions for which components or which technology you are interested in and what, what would make sense to add. Uh, and uh, you can also find a link to repository in there for the, um, for the instructions how to deploy with APB. Um, if, you, if you want to be included in the early adopts program, you can contact any of us, uh, Stephen here, Sherard in the back, and then I'm there as well. Um, and uh, we will do our best to include you if, uh, if you have an interesting project that you would like to try to run on, it, on, on uh, Open Data. And I think that's it for the talk. And we have five minutes for questions. If there are any. That was either very confusing or very, very clear. question is on multi-tenancy. So right now we, uh, we don't leverage the OpenShift multi-tenancy with this. Uh, so we use OpenShift as an authentic uh, authentication provider, but everything that I showed that got deployed, like Spark Cluster and the Jupyter Notebook, that all happens in a single namespace. So basically we need to have a very, very big namespace for that. 
Uh, we are also looking into how to how to split these things and then basically use the OpenShift resource planning and uh, resource quotas for uh, so that everyone gets their own namespace and things get deployed there. But right now it's all deployed in a single namespace and Jupyter Hub takes care of the multi-tenancy part where you get your own container where your code runs and then uh, in the set you get your own credentials with your uh, where you can create your buckets and then and then Spark is, is your is a, is a also an instance that is that is assigned to you. The idea is that you have one open data hub deployed on an open ship cluster not one hub in every namespace. Right, That's yes. Right now, right now, the vision for, for this version of Open Data Hub is that you have one Open Data Hub and then your data scientists come in as they want or need and they use it. Um, but uh, we are also uh, looking into like running a specific services per user and using the, multi the OpenShift multi-tenancy. I think it will very much depend on what kind of service uh, that is. So I guess that, for example, Kafka, you want to have a single thing for many streams coming in, uh, but there might be different services that, that would make more sense to have it deployed in your own namespace. Like the model training uh, jobs or, or uh, model serving jobs probably would be better to go into your own namespace with your own resource limitations. Okay, thank you very much everyone. Thank you for coming so early.